Hello everybody, my name is Griffin and you are tuning in to the Command Valley for another podcast episode. Joining me today is Landon. Hey guys, good to be here. We're actually doing this over Discord today, so a little bit different and we'll have a little bit more unique of a conversation. But before we begin, just a reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by Game Grid Lehigh. If you're looking to get any cards from Zenicar Rising or if you're looking to get any of the cards that we're talking about today, including the new pre-cons that Game Grid is selling right now, uh, both for $40 or each for $20 respectively, head on over to store.gglehigh.com where you'll be able to put in any cards, any deck list that you need and get them shipped right to your house. We will have a link for that also in the description below. Another reminder that this episode is also brought to you by our patrons. If you're looking for another way to support the Command Valley, head on over to patreon.com slash command valley and check out all of our awesome tiers, exclusive benefits that you can that you can partake of. So today we're going to be talking about the new pre-constructed decks that released with Zendikar Rising. We have two of them. We have the Lands Matter and then the, the Sneak Attack deck um, that are both kind of like the Planeswalker decks of Commander. So Len and I are just going to be talking about it, having a nice conversation, and hopefully you guys get something out of it. We felt that this was kind of relevant to talk about simply because we haven't actually seen a lot of other content creators kind of touch this product um, besides like the ones that were announcing it. And probably just because it feels like this product is geared towards newer players and there's a lot of other really exciting products being released alongside with it. And there's just, like a lot of other stuff to talk about. But I think that this product is super interesting. And um, we think that there's some discussion to be had about these products in particular. So we're going to be going over that. Um, do we want to just start off with our first impressions of these decks? Like on a, like when I say a mechanical level, like. Yeah, go for it, Landon. Give us your first impressions of these, these pre-constructed decks. Okay, well, I will start with the Anawan, the sneak attack deck, simply because... And if you guys are interested, Griffin and I both did upgrade videos for these decks down in the description below. You can go watch that. So if you have purchased this deck and you're interested in making it a little bit better or a little bit more tuned, we do have that content for you. So starting with Anawan, the Ruin Thief, he is a legendary creature vampire rogue. He gives all of your other rogues plus one plus one. And whenever a rogue you control deals combat damage to a player, that player mills a card for each damage is dealt. And if they mill at least one creature, your card this way you get to draw a card so he is anawan is like the de facto rogue uh tribal commander now um there was another one before sig river river cutthroat who is also in the deck but anawan just is better for rogues and my first impression of the deck was um it's loaded up with basically all of the good rogues that exist or existed up until this point like when he was spoiled, I just went on the gather, and, and this is before we had seen any of the spoilers for Zendikar Rising. I was like looking through all the rogues, and I was like, oh geez, <laughs> there are not very many rogues, and like not a lot of them are like super impactful. Um, and then they didn't really print any rogues that like were really that impactful. Do you feel the same way about that? About like didn't really feel like they gave the rogues like they gave us any rogues that were like any better than the rogues that we already had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, I'm actually going through the same struggle for my Tazri deck that I'm going to be playing on the next episode of Duel of the Peaks is that rogues really are the the type of card that rogues generally are, are just not powerful. They're they're they are little hitters that don't do that much damage, but they have other small effects. So it's a tribe that hasn't been represented, but doesn't have that much power to it. So I don't know, it, like Wizards could have printed some really busted rogues, but I don't know if that's on theme for, for rogues in general. Well, and I think the other problem was is they couldn't print any uh, really powerful rogues in, well, I guess they could have and just, well, hold on, let me finish my thought actually. One, one thought that I had was they couldn't print any rogues that were severely broken because there already is a rogue archetype in standard and they probably didn't want to push that archetype too far. And I, I think that, so they probably didn't want to print any rogues that would be absolutely busted. And I think, but I, on that same side, they could have they could have just printed cards and said that all the cards in the pre-cons aren't playable in standard. But again, I don't know how well that would do. And I'm also wondering if that's just going to be, and if they continue to do this product where they release a commander pre-con along, alongside the standard set, if that's always going to be an issue where they're worried about printing cards into, this, into the product that are going to be um, restricted because they're also going to be legal on standard. So they, they have to worry about, about that. 
Right. And we'll get to that point a little bit later when we talk yeah. about the um, the kind of purpose of the decks and, and mm-hmm. why they, they are so cheap. But another thing I wanted to point out is I honestly like Anawana. I know rogues aren't very powerful, but I like that they tried to bring a commander that was non-represented. I mean, Sig was the rogue commander, but we didn't have an actual like rogue tribal that tried to right. mix Ro- in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that tried to mix in these small unblockable creatures with an effect that could that could you could build around. So the builds that I've seen around Anna One, like yours, are you mill your opponents and then you cast stuff from their hands in their graveyards. And I, I and I think that's really cool. And I like that that's that's kind of what it seems to be around. I just don't think that this deck really encapsulate that enough. But I, I I'm curious if they just couldn't because then it wouldn't fit into this twenty dollar uh, theme. Yeah, well, and I think that the deck, um, the problem with that, like, casting stuff from your opponent's hands and up an opponent's graveyard is that's actually really powerful. And a lot of effects that do that generally are, are fairly expensive as far as mana cost goes. Mm-hmm. And I think that just kind of slows things down. When you have a bunch of effects that are wanting you to, you know, pull stuff from your opponent's graveyard or from their hands, it's a lot of mana to do stuff like that. And um, it just kind of slows things down. Like, Sepulchral Primordial. It pulls creatures out of opponents' graveyards. It's absolutely huge, seven mana, and um, it's not even really a rogue, and it's in the deck. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, we have cards like Gaunti, Lord of Luxury, that lets you cast things from your opponent's library. You, you, like you said, we have Sepulchre Primordial that lets you put things from people's graveyards, and I like that. That feels rogue to me, where you have these small hitters that give you a little bit of payoff. And then you have these spells that can start getting stuff from your opponent. So I feel like the the Rogue Tribal deck was a breath of fresh air, and I liked it. I think there needs to be... I, I really do think that there needs to be upgrades in this deck in order for it to play, you know, even with some casual pre-cons that we've gotten before. Yeah, that's why in, in, my per, in my upgrade that I did, I tried to lower the mana curve a lot. Like, I cut a lot of the cards that were over six mana just because I felt like way too much mana for the deck like i I just hate only doing one thing per turn um so that yeah that was the first thing that i noticed but i'm super interested so we started getting rogue tribe like rogue support what was it in core 21 with thieves guild enforcer was that core 21 yeah thieves guild enforcer and then the um the robber robber of the rich that was yeah robber of the rich which is red which is too bad yeah Um, (laughs) but I, I'm hoping that they're, the fact that they are doing this means we're going to be getting more rogues maybe in Commander Legends. I could definitely see there being like a lot of ro- rogue support in that. But moving on to the Land's Wrath deck, my first impressions of it were a little bit uh, s- s- sweet and sour because we had just gotten Omnath from Zenikar Rising, the four color uh, landfall deck, which was just so much better. And my first thoughts when I saw a boon was... Well, I might as well just switch a boon out for Omnath and add another color, and then it, it's just that much better. But what I what I've come to learn, and this I, I've kind of found it with the um, upgrade video that I did, is that a, a boon does something a little bit different. It's more of a beat down uh, plus one plus one counter theme, and I think that's a little bit more different than Omnath to the point that I don't feel like now the best thing to do is just to switch Omnath out for a boon. Because there, there, there is some pretty cool things that you can do with a boon, um, and, and they kind of hint to it in the deck a little bit. Lots of upgrades to be made, though. But um, my first impressions of, of a boon were a little bit weak, but as I got to learn the deck a little bit more, I do think that it's actually, it, it looks like it's a pretty fun deck. Uh, there, it's missing card draw, and it's missing some other stuff. But, you know, as far as a $20 deck goes, uh, I'm, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, definitely. And I think that there is a lot of room um, for card draw. Like card draw definitely exists in this color combination and in this in this strategy. Like this deck is all about getting large creatures. And there are so many cards in green that reward you with card draw for having big creatures. I mean like Rish Card's Expertise or Return of the Wild Speaker. Oh yeah, even cards like Soul of the Harvest that reward you for playing creatures. I mean there are so many cards in green that reward you for playing creatures. So like this deck is just lacking those and it's not that it doesn't exist in the strategy. So my, my first impressions of this deck was actually that it was severely more strong, like more powerful than the rogue deck. I just look at like the creature quality and it seems like there are a lot more impactful creatures in this deck than in the rogue deck. And I, I think that's because 
this deck isn't really focused on any particular tribe. It, you're just playing big creatures and making your land and animating your lands into powerful, powerful creatures as well. Whereas the the rogue deck, you are playing creatures that are bad just because they're rogues, just just for the sake of having them in your deck because on a one rewards you for hitting people with rogues. So uh, this deck isn't restricted by that though. So I think that th just like the overall qu card quality, just from my first impression was that this this deck was actually stronger, even though it's missing that card draw. I still oh, feel I agree like it 100%. Would. Oh, it has Return of the Wild Speaker though. It does have Return of the Wild Speaker. And, and I mean, you've got Omnath Locus of Rage <laughs> in this deck. And honestly, yeah. Omnath Locus of Rage can just take the game on its own. But I don't feel like there's a card in the, the Rogue deck that can really do that. I mean, Una is probably the one that's get closest. But I'd rather play a Omnath than an Una. Yeah, but the Rogue deck also doesn't have a lot of answers for getting hit with big creatures every turn. I mean, most of the time it's going to be tapped down because you are wanting to attack. Um... So, and I feel like this deck has the mana acceleration um, that the Anawan deck or the Rogue deck doesn't have. So it's going to be getting out its big hitters earlier. So I just think, think like the overall speed was, it's just a little bit quicker and it hits a little bit harder. So real quick, uh, before we start talking about the pricing of the deck and who we think it's aimed towards, let's talk about the reprints. So in the Lands Wrath, the Aboon Muldai Ancestor deck, we have some pretty notable reprints. The two highest ones are Omnath Locus of Rage, which is three red, red, green, green for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature elemental with landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a 5-5 five, five red and green elemental creature token onto the battlefield. And whenever Omnath Locus of Rage or another elemental, you control dies it deals three damage to target creature or player it, it was it was a sitting sitting at a good price and uh it's still Wasn't it 15 dollars well it's sitting at 13 dollars right now and even after a reprint that's that's pretty that's pretty hot uh but we'll see you see that probably go down as more people buy this product um but that's number one number two is um admonition angel which is three white 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 for a flying angel six six with landfall that exiles target non-land permanent um, other than Admission Angel, and when it leaves the battlefield, return all cards exiled with it to the battlefield under their owner's control. And that was sitting at about $15 too, and right now it's at 11 So those wow. are the two big reprints. Uh, but we, yeah. also, we also have a couple of other little ones. Uh, so we've got Soaring and Arcane Signet in this, which are just kind of basic uh, reprints. But again, always happy to see something like that. Um, Multani Yavamaya's Avatar was actually one I didn't know that was creeping up in price. Uh, it was getting about to seven, seven or eight dollars, and, and right now it's climbed back down to five in this deck. Um, so that's pretty Dang. good. Uh, but those are those are the most notable notable reprints in this. We've got the new cards right now that the prices are fluctuating on them because they haven't officially been released until today. Um, but you know those will those will change but yeah uh, what about the the sneak attack deck what are the notable reprints in that in that deck so for this deck it's really similarly to the obun deck it's kind of the legendary creatures that are really the heavy hitters in the deck so we've got una queen of the fey which really hasn't seen another reprint in any other deck i mean it got a secret lair reprint but that doesn't really affect the price at all um and it's it's a really good card in the deck i mean it's it's not a rogue itself but um, Una can make you rogues. You pay X in the hy hybrid Demir and you choose a color. Uh, target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. And for each card of the chosen color exiled this way, you create a 1 1 blue and black fairy rogue creature token to flying. So I honestly think like Una is probably one of the stronger creatures in the deck, even though it's not a rogue. I mean, it can exile opponents' cards, you know, get rid of their win cons maybe, and it makes you a bunch of fairy rogues. So that's pretty cool. I kind of mentioned this one earlier Sig River Cutthroat. He is a. Legendary creature Merfolk Rogue for two mana, and at the end of each turn, if an opponent lost three or more life this turn, you can draw a card. So that fits really well with the theme of attacking with rogues every turn, because um, Anawan's going to draw you cards if you hit creatures, and Ana and Sig's going to draw you cards if you do at least three damage, which isn't that hard in the deck. So, and then there was also Notorious Throng, which is a tribal sorcery that has a prowl cost. So prowl is a super cool mechanic. I was actually kind of disappointed that they didn't print 
like they gave us new cards and I'm like disappointed that the new cards didn't have prowl but um the prowl cost it's an addition it's an alternative cost that you can cast it for if you dealt combat damage to a player with a rogue and the prowl cost is actually more mana than the mana cost but you put x11 black fairy rogue creature tokens with flying into play where x is the damage dealt to your opponents this turn and if notorious throngs prowl cost was paid you get to take an extra turn so Six mana for an extra turn and a bunch of rogues into play that you can then use to attack with. I've super powerful spell. Probably one of the best cards in the deck. Um, I would actually consider that to be one of the only win cons, I guess. No, that's, that's not the only win con, but it's probably the most like consistent, I would say. This deck also has a soul ring and an arcane signet. And uh, it does have a Demir signet, which is actually like climbing up in price. I think Demir signet was up to like six, six dollars. Um, definitely one of the more expensive signets, so... I believe there's also an Obelisk of Erd, which is actually up at $8 too. Oh yeah, there is. Yep, Obelisk of Erd. Also another win con-ish. Yes, yeah. Well, it does pump your rogues, so. Which would be really good if you have Una out. Or Notorious Thong, you make some really strong yeah. rogues. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, Griffin, after we've looked over the reprints in the deck and just our general first impressions... What do you think, like, the, the power level of these decks are? Not necessarily compared against each other, but just, like, average commander decks that you would see at your local game store or maybe in your playgroup. I know that can vary a lot, but just, like, generally, what would you say? Definitely. And, um, Lennon, I know you and I aren't a big fan of power level numbers, so I won't Definitely. say a power level <laughs> number. Uh, but I do feel like a boon is on on the weaker side, and that's not that's not because the deck itself, the strategy is weak. It's just they've it's a it's a twenty dollar deck, and it does feel like a twenty dollar deck. And I think it is very good for for new players. But I think this is on on the weaker side of uh, of the table. So if you're bringing this to a commander table, you're gonna find that uh, unless you're playing against severely casual decks, you're gonna you're gonna be behind um behind most most games and i think that that's okay um what do you think about the the sneak attack deck i think the sneak attack deck is um it's slow and i think the same thing of the obun deck i think that these decks are not aiming to win until after turn nine or ten and neither of these decks really have that explosive power uh like they take a lot of build up you have to have quite a uh, develop board state like with the rogue deck you would have to have lots of pieces on the table pumping up your rogues um, your opponents would also have to be at a lower life total um, the Oboon deck you need to have lots of powerful creatures in play you've already had to have ramped a lot and the deck doesn't have a lot of ways of putting extra lands into play besides a couple of ramp spells so I think just these decks overall are just slow I don't think that they're necessarily bad um, but I think that the Obun deck, or at least Obun himself, scales a lot higher than Ana one. I think that there are a lot of, like, really powerful cards in Landfall. And, like, you talked about this in your upgrade video. I mean, cards like Classification, you know, make a land a 2020. You know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Which is super cool. I think Ana one like doesn't scale as much because there aren't as many good cards that already exist for his specific strategy. And sure, you can put in cards like Ristic Study, you know, Mana Drain, Force of Will, stuff like that. But I don't know if that necessarily helps the strategy any more than putting in cards like Exploration, Sylvan Library, you know, cards like that into the Obun deck. What do you think? Definitely. I do think that these have the, I mean, now that we've talked about kind of where they're at, We've both done upgrade videos on it, and I do believe that these decks can can be uh, forces to be reckoned with. I think that these decks, once upgraded, can play with with good, um, you know, like mid tier, uh, maybe to higher tier commander uh, decks. I mean, just with the the fifth, I can't remember. I I did twelve cards. I think maybe you did thirteen. But even with those cards that we put in, we dramatically raised the power level of the deck. So at least for a boon, putting more landfall triggers, putting more things that uh, you know, like classification that can make your your lands extreme threats having more things like that in the deck have made it uh like brought the power level up so i think these decks are really good in that way where they're 20 dollars to start off pretty weak um if you're trying to play with you know new players these are perfect to play against each other um i won't necessarily say that and maybe these two specifically just because a boon seems to be much more powerful than um and i want to at first just because landfall is just such a it is a very powerful mechanic yeah, and I guess we'll find out when we, you know, release our Duel of the Peaks episode. Excited to see how, how they fare against each other. I'm really excited about this product, even though, like, these decks aren't crazy strong. Like, and that's that's totally okay. I 
don't need every single pre-constructed deck that wizards give us to be massively powerful i think that this is super good for like a lot of the friends that i have that maybe play standard or play modern or maybe friends that don't even play magic um to get them into commander i think these decks are perfect it's just kind of a shame that there are only two of them because then i would have to have like at least two other decks um but maybe there is something to be said about for now these, you know yeah for now or just there might be something to like there to just sit down with these decks one-on-one -on -one against each other um with, with a newer player because getting a new player into commander um you know it's kind of a time commitment of for a four player game i mean it can be two to three hours and it might seem overwhelming for a new player because a lot of decisions have to be made with three other people at the table um a lot of things can happen people that take maybe a little bit longer turns might kind of confuse the newer player so having these two decks that are fairly balanced against each other and super cheap price you can play them one-on-one -on -one against each other and just really help the new person like understand the rules of commander like they don't have to worry about the two other players um they're just worrying about one other deck and then once you've played these decks a couple of times and they kind of get a really good feel for the rules then you can introduce them to a four-player pot i i just kind of feel like that's a good segue into the really complicated um game that is edh what do you think absolutely i i, I also think that the pre-cons that we've seen before i think um last year is the one with uh the morph commander um kadena kadena and the jeskai one were were more simple decks and i like that i like when there's more simple strategies that can get people in the commander because you look at the purpose of the planeswalker decks and they were simply only for new players very easy decks that would never compete in a tournament never compete in standard they were just new decks to introduce players into magic a little bit more and i think these commander decks represent that also as just the the planeswalker deck of commander so i i love these these decks as introductions to to commander so the next question that we wanted to ask was like, are these decks worth it? And we've had like a couple of people ask us that. Um, some of our patrons and just some of the people that I've talked to that play Magic are just kind of like, everyone's kind of curious, like, is this a, a good way to spend your $20? And I think like a really short answer to that is yes. I think that these decks are, are pretty worth it for 20 bucks. You get a hundred cards, you get a deck. Um, even if you don't anticipate, you know, ever playing it, like just having like this simple deck already pre-constructed that you could give to a friend you never know when you're going to meet somebody at your local game store or you know whoever you're going to meet throughout life and it's always good to bring new people into the commander format i mean i think it's a wonderful form i think that it's a wonderful format we've had a lot of fun with it so just on that ground alone i think it's worth it i also think that it's very much worth it i mean just think of it this way how many times have you built a deck for twenty dollars never <laughs> no even if it I, wasn't as good yeah. as the other decks no, I've never been able to build a deck for $20. The lowest I've ever gone is like, I, I believe it was like 47 Yeah. I think was my record. Definitely. I mean, it's it's possible to build $20 decks, and it might just come down to like a matter of personal choice. Like, I start with looking at all the cards in my collection, I put it together. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's different though, because um, a lot of the cards that I put into my decks, even if I don't spend $20, are worth more than $20. So yeah. I don't think that I could build a deck um for twenty dollars <laughs> i'd be kind of hard pressed to do that i think if you had twenty dollars and went to your local game store and tried to build a deck uh a commander deck with just twenty dollars i don't think that you could get to a deck that would scale against these two uh pre-constructed decks you, I think. you couldn't build these pre-constructed decks for twenty dollars i mean no not at you, all you can't yeah so it's right now like six five to six times that much so that's why i think it's absolutely worth it i mean there are I don't really look at like the financial value of cards because it's it's more for the game instead of the financial value. But there are Definitely. notable reprints and expensive cards and it's a commander deck for $20. So even if you're an experienced player, you can grab these decks and upgrade them or keep them uh, virgin for, for your friends that could be wanting to play commander or just even have these decks sitting around so you can play a casual game of commander. Say if you uh, are more into the higher powered uh, commander and maybe your friends are a little bit frustrated because they like to play more casual then you can have one of these decks to just be able to sit down and, and and play with them definitely i think it's just like a good tool to have in your archive of decks and it's super interesting because the philosophy that wizards of the coast has had for all of the other pre-cons has actually been the same philosophy that they had with these pre-cons just all the other decks were twice the money um and the prices were going up as well like they went from $30 to $40 to $45 and um they're I think Ikoria like it was kind of hard to find them for under 50 wasn't that right like 50 per deck 
So uh, Game Grid sold them for 40. So it was 30 to 35 to 40. Yeah. I feel like these decks, uh, I don't, it's kind of hard to say if they're any weaker than the other pre-cons. I don't know. I mean, they have the same price as a lot of them did when they were released. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how they fare against the other pre-con decks. Maybe that's something that we can do. Maybe we can uh, keep these and, uh, oh, that'd be a cool video. We could play these two pre-cons against the two pre-cons that are coming out in Commander Legends. That'd be kind of cool. I don't know if the pre-cons from, from Commander Legends are going to be the same kind of $20 a style, but I would love to see more of these. I think it would be great if we had one collection of, of Commander decks once a year that were more high-powered, higher-tier uh, Commander decks that were, you know, $40, and, and they, you know, they appealed more to the more veteran players, mm -hmm. and then we have these just going along every standard set to just introduce people to Commander. I love that idea. I love bringing people into Commander, so I think these decks are uh, an absolute win. Yeah. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> so kind of for our next point, we kind of wanted to discuss um, kind of like what we feel, like how we feel about the longevity of this product. Is this something that we'd like to see with every standard set or is this something that we would like to have maybe once or twice a year? And then like things that we would like to see in these decks, like specifically. So as a as a filthy casual player, um, I... I I love the idea of putting more casual decks into the market, and I like the idea of pushing more casual decks into Commander players' arsenal. I think um, recently, out of, of all the Commander games that I've played, um, the the vast majority of them are people that are just playing very high power decks, and it just seems the power level seems to be just creeping up. And I think that uh, Wizards has also pushed that into a lot of the the pre cons where they have these very powerful commanders that you can build. And it, it's a it's refreshing to me to see these commander decks that are not that are not 10 out of 10 decks. They're not even seven out of 10 decks. They're just very casual decks that they just release along standard decks that introduce new people to commander. And, and I I love that idea. I want them to keep doing this. Um, I think two decks along with every standard set of just like these easy commander decks is a, is, is a great idea. I don't know how long that would last, um, but I think the longevity is there. I think that these decks are going to be played with and bought and used for, for a long time. Definitely. And I think that like they have a lot of potential um, to do a lot of good for not only Wizards of the Coast, but for like the commander community as a whole. And I know it's kind of hard to like kind of get a temperature reading on the commander format simply because it's such a large format it's very ambiguous because you have all different types of people playing all different types of ways in all different types of places and there really is no competitive play so everything really comes down to your specific meta and the people that you play with but one thing that kind of does affect it is wizards of the coast like increasing the power level of commanders and we've definitely see that we've definitely seen that with standard at least um wizards often equates you know, more powerful cards into better cells because people are cracking the packs and they might be right on that. But I definitely agree with Griffin. I really do enjoy casual games of Commander that seem like more of like a social hangout type of deal. And I think that's kind of the appeal to Commander is it's not competitive. You can just kick back, relax and play like a super flavorful deck and have fun with your friends. But I also play CDH, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're along the whole spectrum. The whole spectrum. Because it's, and I think that's an interesting thing because it's just, it's such a fun game, right? No matter like how you're playing it, Commander is just so much fun. It is, and I, I, I would absolutely have fun sitting down and playing these decks. Len and I are actually not going to be playing these decks on the next episode of Duel of the Peaks. Um, we did the upgrades on them, but we're actually going to be passing the Virgin decks over to Caleb and Peter to play them. But we will be playing other... We, we tried to make decks that are similar to this level where they're filthy, casual decks. Uh, but it will be a really fun <laughs> game. It's probably going to be one of the most um, casual Duel of the Peaks episodes that you will see. Yeah, and like when we say filthy casual or casual in general, that doesn't really we're not trying to like depreciate like depreciate the inherent value of these decks. I think that they're super cool. I'm actually really excited for this gameplay. Like more excited than like a lot of our other gameplays cuz I'm super stoked to see the interactions be between these decks. Like I'm genuinely curious. Um and there are like a lot of cards as I'm looking over this list that like I've seen these cards before and I've want to put I've wanted to put them into decks. But I haven't because I'm afraid that these cards just simply aren't good enough. And I think that's a real shame. We're like, I'm cutting cards that I like and I think are cool simply because they're just simply not good enough. Um, 
And I think that's probably a, a kind of a toxic trait of Commander is when you feel like you can't play the cards you want because the power level of your playgroup is too high. I think at that point, maybe something needs to change in your meta. You need to have a conversation about that. But that is probably a different episode all to itself. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. Not not playing cards that you want because like, like I'm looking at this card Spore Mound. Like that just looks so cool. Whenever you play a land, you get a green, you get lettuce, you get a, a sapling creature. Like, that's cool. Or Waker of the Wilds. I mean, that's cool. Put counters on a land you control and it becomes a huge beasty thing. Like, that's cool. It's a cool card. Yeah, I, yeah I, I also agree. I like the idea of pushing pushing the casual side and, and being able to play casual cards. And um, even with our upgrade videos, we didn't make these decks tier tier one, tier two decks. They're just decks that were, um, you know, Planeswalker decks that we upgraded a little bit um, to make it a little bit more functional in the way that you you still want to be drawing cards and, and, you know, the classic thing like that, ramping and drawing cards. But still, they're, they're casual decks and, and I love casual. Definitely. Um, and another thing that I think is important to note is it does increase. I think it also increases your skill just as a player to play lower power decks because you're you're making more decisions that affect the game. I think anybody can sit down with a Chulain deck or a Corvold deck or an Urza deck and like, yeah, those commanders are so broken. Like you're being rewarded for doing nothing other than playing the deck. I think Obun and Anawan, you kind of have to work for it. Like, um... And I think that's really good. I think it increases your your skill as a as a player, and that's something I'm 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 a big fan of that. Me too. Me too. So, what are some things like you'd like to see in this product in the future? Like, let's say they release um, two more of these decks in call time, because we know that we're getting five precons for Strixhaven. But like, let's just take call time for example. If they do it again, what would you like to see? I would love to see flavorfully casual decks that anybody can grab for for cheap price and bring it out and play a commander game with their friends. And I think this deck or these two decks do a great job of that. So honestly, I want them to continue what they're doing. This is not the place for reprints um, since they are Planeswalker decks. I, I would rather these just be functional decks um, and uh, functional decks that people can sit down and play with. What Definitely. about you? Um... So I, I disagree with you a little. I actually would like to see more reprints. <laughs> um, but I don't know, maybe maybe that would make it so people that like aren't new players would have a hard time getting their hands on it because everybody else is buying it just to crack it open and sell the cards back to the game store. <laughs> um, but I think we've seen what that. happens when they when they try to push wizards to put reprints into products that were cheap. The price yeah. goes up. <laughs> but I think they did a good job of like balancing like each deck seems to have three to four expensive cards and the rest are just like flavorful cards or cards, you know, with the strategy of the deck. Um, Definitely. I personally would like to see, um, I was like a little bit disappointed that each deck only had one new legendary creature. Um, like instead of getting one legendary creature and two like random other like cards for the deck that are new, I would have just preferred three new legendary creatures. But I don't know, maybe that... um doesn't vibe too well with these being for new players, but I, I think you can make an argument for that it is good for new players because then maybe once they've played the deck a couple of times with the face commander and they're like, well, I kind of want to take this deck in a different direction. They don't have to look too far for a different commander to use. The deck already has two others. They can swap it out and then build kind of a, a different strategy from that point. I think that's a good segue into that, but what do you think? No, I think that is a good idea. I was actually just thinking that I think these decks could do with at least one other face commander that you could you could swap out. Uh, the the challenge that I've seen with those though, and I I saw this specifically in the um, Otrimi deck, the Otrimi commander deck, is that the the balance between the face commanders and the strategies that they tried to entail were different, and the deck showed different strategies. and 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 Caleb and I talked about how we didn't we didn't love that. So I think, yeah, I think it, it, it's good to have other face commanders. I just think that if those face commanders have other strategies that um, they tie very closely to or are different enough that you, you don't have to change the deck um, or you would have to change the deck in order to make that that work, but it still fits in with the deck. I think taking on one, for example, like he's got two or three different like things on the card, like pumping up your rogues um milling your opponent and drawing you cards so like there are three things there 
maybe the two other commanders, like one could focus on like making your rogues a lot stronger. And then the other one focuses on like the milling aspect of it. You see what I'm saying? So like the other two commanders, like kind of draw from the text on the face commander, but like focused on a different part of it. Yeah. I think that would have been cool. And then like, Definitely. I think that also increases the power of the deck too. Um, makes it like a little bit stronger, which like we've kind of talked about earlier in the episode, like that's not always like the most important thing, but once like a new player has gotten their foot in the water and like they've, you know, played the deck, I think the next step is powering up the deck and making it function better because you don't want to just sit there with no cards in your hand, just top decking and just, you know, getting steamrolled. So I just, you know, I think there is a balance between that. How do you feel about uh, more cards from the standard set being put in these decks? Do you think that's kind of like a cop out? <laughs> or i don't think it's a i don't think it's a cop out i like and i kind of talked about this in our um i can't remember if it's our sweet c20 predictions uh but i i like that they have cards that you can put in to these decks from the commander or the standard set and i like that there's uh there's like a um a link or a bridge between between the two because i think it's a good way for standard players to be introduced to commander so i'm totally cool oh with yeah that. i'm definitely. totally cool with me being incentivized to open these these standard products because if i get these decks and i want to switch them out like for instance the ancient green warden which is in the main set which slots in amazingly with um with the aboon deck okay. and then you have zareth yeah. song um which fits in really well with the rogue deck definitely well and another thing is I know a lot of people that play standard that will get into it and then like rotation comes around and then they don't want to get into the new rotation, right? Like they had their fun for like a year or two years and then like, you know, maybe they just don't want to play standard anymore. This offers them a way to still use those cards that they had in standard and still have fun with them, right? Because they just put in this in these pre-cons. So I think that's a, that's a cool thing. So those were our thoughts about the the new precon commander decks. We would love to hear what you guys think of these Zendikar Rising precon commander decks. Uh, let us know in the comments below what you think. Um, what you think about the reprints, the decks as, as as a whole. If your guys are getting these decks, and if you haven't gotten these decks and you want these decks, then head on over to store.gglehigh.com where they are selling both the the precon commander decks for twenty bucks a piece or forty bucks each. Uh, that they will ship right to your door. That's a super good deal. Super um, good. I, don't, I haven't looked at any other uh, shops or anything like that. Um, kind of scared to, to be honest, because the MSRP. But yeah, if you want to look at <laughs> uh, get those decks yourself, um, go ahead and check those out. And if you have those decks, or if you're going to get those decks and you want to look at upgrades, then go ahead and check out our upgrade videos for the two pre-cons that we will link in the description uh, for you guys to check out. But other than that, Lennon, do you have anything to say? No, that's that's everything. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you to our subscribers and our patrons. You guys are awesome. We really couldn't do this without you guys, and we're super happy to be a part of this community. And with that, we will see you guys on our next podcast episode. Hope you guys have an amazing weekend. Peace. See ya.